Blog Talk Radio. Mi chiamo Afura Kanu Afurai Kaitnut. Ne ye ujira da, me dinde ujira po, kwesi rane mbuta aka. Akwa mu main amaruka, the TV mu ujira po, ujira main mu. Greetings to all Afura Kani Afurai Kaitni people, meaning Africans, black people today. It's Ojira Day, Purification Day. My name is Ojirafo Kwesi Ranahim Pata Akan, Ojirafo of the Akwamu Nation in North America, within Ojirama, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afuraikai people in the Western Hemisphere. Yet I say we thank you once again for tuning into the broadcast. We have opened up the chat room. If you have any questions or comments, and you'd like to interact in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact. If you don't have a username, you can sign up for one quickly in Blog Talk. If you have any questions or comments uh, on the phone line, simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised and we can connect that way. Uh, we have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akanfo Nanasom, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion on Joda on Monday night, where we deal specifically with the Akan expression of Nanasom, of Ancestral Religion, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion. First and foremost, the reason why we deal with specifically the Akan expression of Nanasom on Joda Monday nights, first and foremost, because we are Akan. Secondly, because of the misinformation being propagated regarding Akan ancestry religion, culture, philosophy, ritual practice, the nature of the Abosom, the divinities, the nature of the Nananom, Nsamampo, the nature of Nyamewa and Nyame, the supreme being, and Nyonkumpon and Nyonkumpon, the creator and creatress, and so forth. Misinformation, not only coming from individuals in the Western Hemisphere, whether it's North America, Central America, South America, the Caribbean, Jamaica, and so forth, misinformation coming from individuals in the Western Hemisphere, but also misinformation coming from those Akan individuals on the continent of Afuraka, Afuraikai, and Ghana, and Ivory Coast who have been infected with pseudo-religion, with Christianity, Islam, white culture in general. Those who have become infected, their presentation of the culture is an infected presentation. Therefore, they are misinforming because they are weaving in traditional ritual practices and knowledge with misinformation from white culture, and that presentation is infected. So we deal with ancient, authentic Akan ancestry religion, which takes us back to our Akan ancestry, which goes back to ancient Kana, the Khan land first, land foremost, land, land of the beginning. That is the title of ancient Nubia. Some of our people migrated from ancient Kanat, the Kanat Empire, after the fall of Kameda, northern Kanat, migrated to the western part of the continent, reestablished the Kanat Empire or the Empire of Ghana a couple of thousand years ago. After Muslim invasions, a thousand years later, some of our people migrated further south from that region to the area which is today called Ivory Coast in Ghana and reestablished the Akana Empire in those areas. Hundreds of years after that, some of our people were taken from those regions to North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musuo Kessie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. This is how we ended up in the Western Hemisphere. But we maintained our ancestral religious traditions. Those who practice the Akan tradition in Suriname, for example, South America, called the tradition Wing Ti. Those who practice the authentic Akan ancestry religion in Jamaica call it Obia. Those who practice Akan ancestry religion in North America, the term we use is Hudu, from the Akan term Hudu, which means medicine from plants, trees, plant life. It also means to become heavy with the spirit from spirit possession, spirit communication, and so forth. Hudu is the origin of the term Hudu, the Akan term Obai is where you get Obaya or Obeya from in Jamaica. The Akan term Hinti or Fuinti. There's different, a dialectical variant. 
In one Akan dialect, it's Hinti. In another Akan dialect, it's Huinti, like H.W. Huinti. And this is where you get the term Huinti in South American Suriname for the Akan tradition. So we've maintained our ancestral religious traditions, passed on to us spirit genetically and transcarnationally from our direct blood ancestresses and ancestors who were forced into this hemisphere 300 years ago. And that tradition we have passed on intergenerationally and transcarnationally through successive reincarnations since we've been here. We've maintained our traditions. And through that maintenance, we were empowered and guided to wage war against the whites and their offspring to force the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere. So this is what we deal with on our Kanpo Nanasom, ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion. On Awukuda, Akwada Wednesday night, we have Egua Marketplace, where we showcase Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions, those who are serving the Afurakani, Afurakani community in a positive capacity, those who maintain their ancestral religious values in the context of that service. We have had a number of individuals come on and showcase their business organizations and institutions. We will have more individuals coming on to showcase their businesses. Of course, we keep have those businesses posted in our books that, for our conferences, the Etchi Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference, the journals for that, the Who Do Mind, Who Do Nation Conference journals for that, which there are three now, the Ogida Mind Purified Nation Conference, Ogida Mind Afashe, which takes place in June, dealing with Amanie Nationism, the journals for that. Those are free online. We also have the soft cover versions. We have the businesses, organizations, and institutions, their businesses, their um, advertisements in those journals. You can see that. We also have their links on our website. We also deal with the economic development model we call OCOM, which is an economic development model rooted in our ancestral religious values. So this is what we deal with on Egua Marketplace Day on Wednesday nights, Awukuda, Akwada, on Yauda, which is also Yada, Abada. Thursday nights we have Amain Sim, Affairs of the Nation. We deal with specific issues that are confronting us as Afurakani, Afurakani people, Ojiraman, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. And we deal with them from a nationist perspective an Amaniye perspective. We recognize the reality that a nation in the true sense, in the properly defined sense, is a living, breathing entity governed by specific abosom. And we as cells within that nation, that organal structure, we have a relationship to one another as Afurakani, Afurakani people, as subjects within that Oman, that nation, but we also adhere to the forces of nature that govern that entity, and we harmonize our activities with that, those forces of nature as well. We have been forced into the Western Hemisphere, but then we were directed by our ancestresses and ancestors to coalesce in a specific region of the Earth Mother's body in the Western Hemisphere. We have blended ancestral blood circles according to the direction of our Nananum Nsumafo spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. We have learned how to interface with the Earth Mother divinities, Asaseyafu and Asaseya, in this region of their body in the Western Hemisphere and their unique expression in this region. We have learned how to deal with plant life, animal life, mineral life that manifests in this region, taking these things into our system for medicine as well as food and so forth. We've also learned to interface with the unique expression of the Abosom, the Orisha, the Vodou, in this region of the Earth Mother's body. And therefore, that confluence of activity, us operating in that fashion, in this unique condition, through the blending of ancestral blood circles in this region, has allowed us to forge a locative identity based on this confluence of activity. So we have, we have formed an Oman, a nation and Ojira Man, a purified nation in the Western Hemisphere. We have a unique approach to life. We have a unique approach to solving our problems from a nationist perspective. We deal with nationism, which is the purification of nationalism, approaching the proper definition of a nation rooted in our ancestral religious values. Not secular nationalism, but we're dealing with nationism. And this is what we deal with on our mind, some affairs of the nation. Tonight is Benada Tuesday, also called Abinada 
we have Ojira, purification. This show, Purification, deals with Afurakani, Afurakani, or African ancestral religion, and how it impacts every aspect of our lives. Not just the Akan expression, but any expression of Afurakani, Afurakani, the ancestral religion, whether it's any people on the continent of Afuraka, Afurakaira, or those of us who have been forced into the Western Hemisphere who maintained our ancestral religious practices. As we said, Akan, ancestral religion in North America is Hoodoo, the Yoruba ancestral religion brought in the blood circles of our people in North America is called Juju. The Ebe and Phone ancestral religion in North America is called Voodoo. The Ovambo tradition in North America is called Wanga. The Fang tradition in North America is called Ngangai. And the Bakango tradition is called Nganga. The Bambara tradition is called uh, Grigri and so forth, so we have maintained our ancestral religious tradition intergenerationally, transcarnationally, and passed these traditions down, as well as the traditional priesthoods and priestesshoods born of our blood circle. So we are not depending on anyone outside of our blood circles for ancestral religious practice, initiation, or anything else. Any communication we have with anybody outside of our blood circles is pure, purely diplomatic relations, purely uh, exchange of ideas and so forth, but the legitimacy and the authority that governs our ancestral religious practice is rooted in our direct spirit genetic blood circle of those ancestresses and ancestors who were forced over here and maintained the ancestral religion they brought in their blood circles and passed down that was time stamped in their spirit genetic blood circles once they arrived on these shores over 300 years ago. And it's that form of the tradition that they passed down to us that is the tradition that we continue. So we talk about the purification of concepts and ritual practice and so forth on the Ojira broadcast. Ancestral religion is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. In essence, no matter what form of ancestral religion we're talking about, Afurakani, Afurakani, the African ancestral religion, which we call Nana Som as a catch-all term. The ritual incorporation of divine law, the ritual restoration of divine balance. That means through ritual we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions and thus realign ourselves with divine order. So the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion are the ritual incorporation of divine law, the ritual restoration of divine balance. We always state that ojira, purification, operationalizes nana song. Purification operationalizes our ritual practice of incorporating law and restoring balance. It is by this means that we are able to execute our divine function in creation, operate in accordance with our ancestral culture. Our ancestral culture or way of life is the divine acceptance, the law, love of order, and the divine rejection, the hatred, the repulsion of disorder and its purveyors. As we execute our function in creation, we seek to align every thought, intention, and action with divine order every moment of every day. That is our culture, our way of life. When we make legitimate mistakes, we engage the ritual process to incorporate divine law, restore divine balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions so that we can continue to move forward and get back on track with our function and creation in harmony with order. So we talk about how Ojira purification operationalizes on our own. Purification operationalizes our ritual practice of incorporating law and restoring balance. This is how ancestral religion impacts every aspect of our lives. When you seek to align every thought, intention, and action with divine order every moment of every day, the only way you can harmonize with divine order is to harmonize with the forces in creation that are the embodiments of divine order. You are engaged in a religious practice on a consistent basis. And when we make decisions, and those decisions determine the outcome of our lives and events and so forth, then we're showing how ancestral religion impacts every aspect of our lives. Tonight's broadcast 
Mpoa Twa challenge sacred panther versus pseudo panther and cultural reversion. The Akan term Mpoa Twa means challenge. We're talking about cultural reversion, which is, includes etchi sign ancestral religious reversion, reverting back to our original pristine state. We're talking about this nature of the sacred panther in our ancestral religious practices and the corruption of this pseudo panther. The basa, as it's called in ancient Kemet, also bai and baisa and basa, the sacred panther as an achinebwa, an animal totem for abosom specific deities and those ancestral panther clans in our ancestral religious practices in Afuraka, Afuraikai and their survival in North America. This is what we want to examine. And we're going to contrast the sacred from the profane and expose the corruption of the whites and their offspring as they seek to profit from our negligence. Of course, people are lining up, saving up their money. They've been planning for over a year. Black people, supposedly culturally grounded people, planning for over a year to go see a movie produced by the whites and their offspring, the Black Panther movie, based on a fictional character, manufactured by the whites and their offspring, with ideas that are taken from our ancestral cultures and corrupted to form this character. So we're waiting in line to give millions of our dollars to the whites and their offspring, give millions of dollars to millionaires. Of course, there will be black people uh, performing in the film and so forth, millionaires, so we're waiting. Some of our people are falling asleep right now with a fist full of cash, waiting for 30 days to pass, 40 days to pass, so they can give that cash to the white millionaires. They're going to give money to white millionaires. What are they receiving in return? A fictional story about fictional, quote-unquote, superheroes. At the end of the day, they will receive misinformation. The whites and their offspring will have been enriched. And, of course, we know already that the whites and their offspring will be promoting dissexuality, homosexuality within the film. That is the major reason the film is being released. It has nothing to do with empowering black people or anything else. Everything the whites and their offspring do is political, and it's designed to control the minds and suppress the intelligence of our people. And we're going to pay millions if we're brainwashed millions tens of millions of dollars so panther we're going to talk about the sacred panther the basa or bai baisa as well sebo in our time we're going to deal with this nature of this panther so first and foremost we're going to talk about a couple of different things. If you look at the image that we use for the broadcast, you see on the left side the image that we have on the broadcast and also posted for the show. On the left side, you have one of the priests or from ancient Kemet wearing a panther skin, a full panther skin, a skin of a basa. Of course, in the middle, that's the sacred fire, ritual fire, and so forth, that is separating the traditional, authentic Sim priest, or Osimpo, as we call it in our con, from the pseudo panther manufactured by the whites and their offspring. Why is this priest wearing a panther skin? And what is the nature of this panther? If you look at a panther just in general, and then we're going to get into this ritual process. Of course, in ancient Kemet, you, there weren't too many black panthers. What you have are leopards, which is called baisa or basa, but that's the same term for panther because leopards are simply spotted panthers. When you have a melanated panther and the spots are not prominent, it's a fully melanated panther, it's simply called a black panther. If it's a spotted panther, that's the term leopard is simply a spotted, means a spotted panther. 
something unique about panthers. Of course, they're ferocious. Of course, they are great hunters and so forth, killers and so forth, males and females. But one important aspect of them, number one, they're nocturnal, operating at night, very active at night, operating within the darkness, navigating their way through the darkness. During the day, they rest in the thick brush on, or in trees. They are solitary, preferring to live alone. Of course, they're very agile and good swimmers. They are able to leap more than 20 feet. These are just some basic things about leopards, panthers. But the key is nocturnal animals, very active at night, very solitary, preferring to live alone, operating alone. They are ferocious hunters and so forth and fighters. Now, you look at this priest, this sim priest, N.H.E. Komet, wearing a panther skin. You also find deities wearing the panther skin, such as Seshat, the divinity, female force of divine wisdom, and other divinities as well. You see the panther skin the, arrayed upon the Ensu, the king, after re- achieving a certain level of development and engaging in ritual practice. So what's going on with this whole notion of this panther skin? First, we're going to read a little section from one of the pyramid texts, the Meru texts, Meru texts, of Unas. The Meru texts of the pyramid texts are the oldest religious compositions yet unearthed in the world. So we're going to read a section from the text of the King Ensu Unas Per A, so called Per A, Per A Unas. And we're going to scroll up right here. Okay, so it says, Behold, Unas, come, he comes. Behold, Unas comes. He comes forth. And if Unas comes not of his own accord, your message having come to him shall bring him. Unas makes his way to his abode. This is after he has made his transition. He's in the spirit realm now, and now he's being announced. He makes his way to his abode. The female cow divinity of the great lake bows down before him. None shall ever take away his food or offerings from the great boat, and he shall not be repulsed at the great white house of the great ones by the region of Meskinet on the border of the sky. Behold, Unas has arrived at the height of heaven and sees his body in the Simketet boat, and Unas labors within that boat. He has satisfied the Arat in the Ma'at boat. So the Simketet boat, that's the night boat. The Ma'at boat is the boat of sunrise. And he has washed it. And the Hinmimet beings have testified concerning him. The winds and storms of heaven have strengthened him, and they introduce him to Ra. Make the two horizons of heaven to embrace Ra so that he may go forth towards the horizon. Make the two horizons of heaven to embrace Herakuti so that he may go forth towards the horizon with Ra. Make the two horizons of heaven to embrace Unas so that he may go forth towards the horizons with Ra. Make the two horizons of heaven to embrace Unas so that he may go forth towards the horizon along with Herakuti and Ra. This Unas is happily united to his Ka, his soul. His panther skin and his grain bag are upon him, his whip in his hand, his scepter in his grasp. They bring him the four Aku, illuminated spirits who dwell in the hair of Heru, who stand on the east side of heaven and are glorious by reason of their scepters, and they declare the fair name of Unas Torah, and they make him to escape from Nehet Kau, that serpent divinity, and the soul of this Unas lives live in the north of the Sekhet Aru, the divine field of offerings, and he sails about in the lake of Ka. While this Unas sails towards the east side of the horizon, while he sails, sails towards the east side of heaven, his sister, the star Sapatit, which is set operates through, gives him birth in the Duat. 
after he makes his transition, they testify to his living in harmony with order while on earth. He's announced by the divinity. He's been strengthened by the forces in creation. He's announced before Ra to go sail on the boat with Ra and so forth. He approaches the creator of the universe in that divine boat. And they say he's happily united with his Ka, that means the soul, the deity dwelling in the head region, the divine force that guides you according to your divine function throughout the course of your life. If you align with that divine force that's pulling you in your head region, then you live in harmony with order and you execute your function properly. If you get out of harmony with that force in the head region, then you create all kinds of problems for yourself. But if you consistently live in harmony with your ka throughout the course of your life, and you make your transition and separate from the physical body, then your spirit and the ka are aligned. The ka will testify to the supreme being on your behalf, saying this individual lived in harmony with me, his ka, while he was on earth. He therefore has the capacity and has the opening to come and dwell with the Nananoman Samanfo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors in that pristine community in the Sekhet Aru, the divine field of offerings, to operate in harmony with the other Abosom, the deities, as their subject and so forth, to be embraced by Ra and so forth, to be filled with that divine living energy in a harmonious fashion so he can wield that energy as an ancestor to his descendants still on earth and so forth. He's able to receive that kind of reception. He enters into the ancestral realm in harmony, in balance, and peace, and so forth. If he didn't live in harmony with order, then he'll be one of these earthbound spirits hanging around the place where he died and harassing people for decades or even centuries. But of course, the text is showing that Unas lived in harmony with order. His, the Hinmimit beings, the spiritual beings, testify concerning him. The deities testify concerning him. Of course, he went through the weighing of the heart and passed that test with Ma'at. And the next test, of course, as we've shown in our multi-power series, is the test that you go through the interrogation with the male deity, Ma'a, and he passed that interrogation as well, and he was accepted into the ancestral realm. He is happily united to his Ka. His Ka didn't separate from him. It testified on his behalf and reconnected to his head region of the spirit body. He is happily united with his Ka. His panther skin and his grain bag are upon him. His whip is in his hand. He's talking about the um, nkaka, the so-called flail, and his scepter is in his grasp. He's talking about that scepter of authority. After he's united with his ka, is showing his panther skin is upon him. He's wearing that sacred panther skin, just like the priest wears the sacred panther skin, just like the um, uh, Sashat, male, female divinity of divine wisdom, wears that sacred panther skin. Why would we wear a panther skin and what is the relationship? We already talked about the nature of the panther, the energy complex of the panther, a nocturnal animal. Now when we talk about the spirit realm, the separation of the spirit from the body, you're going into the spirit realm, you're going into the quote-unquote underworld. It says at the end of this portion of the text, he sails toward the east side of heaven. His sister, the star, Sapatit, which is so-called Sotis or Sirius, or set operating through that star system, gives him birth in the duat, meaning birthing him into the spirit realm, the underworld, so, and so forth. So now you're in the underworld, you're in the spirit world, the 12 hours of the night, so to speak. You're in the nocturnal regions and so forth, and then you don that panther skin, when you're operating through the nocturnal regions, because not only can you see and operate and navigate your way through the spirit realm, the nocturnal regions, but you can also have that divine protection. The panther is a hunter, also a divine killer. Now, if you look at the word for panther, it's ba-sa or ba-sa, also ba or ba in ancient Kemet. That is a term for panther, which, of course, includes the leopard as well, the spotted panther. The term Ba, first and foremost, is the divine living energy animating all created entities. That divine living energy that comes from Ra and Ra, the creator and creatress, that divine living fire within you is shown as a bird, 
with a bowl of incense burning in front of it. Sometimes the bird has the head of the human being who the spirit belongs to, but sometimes it's just the bird. So you have the bird and then the bowl of incense burning in front of the bird. The bird with the wings dealing with the animation, movement, flight, activity, agility, and so forth, and the uh, burning incense is talking about the fire. So the ba is a divine living fire, the animating fire, that, that divine living energy, spiritual force within you that you can direct to different parts of your body to energize yourself and function and so forth. It is your energetic link to the other deities, forces in nature, and other all created entities in the universe. We say created, naturally created. Of course, the whites in their offspring are not naturally created. They degenerated from that which is naturally created. So the Ba is the divine living energy, the animate fire within you. Then the term Sa means a sanctuary, like a shrine or a sanctuary of the deity. A leopard or a panther being called Ba Sa or Ba Sa is that divine living energy operating within a sanctuary, within a container. When you look at the Baisa, the leopard, that divine living fire is operating within a contained space. It's deep within the individual. It's no different than the divine living energy of Ra and Ra moving through the sun. When the sun sets in the west, then they show Ra going into the boat of the night, the Semketet boat, as we talked about. He takes the form of a flat horned ram, an earth animal, and then he's sailing in the underworld in the, in the night boat, that quote-unquote black sun, he's operating within the dark, in the infernal regions, the nocturnal regions. That divine living fire is moving inside of a container. So when you look at the baisa, when you look at the leopard, it's a fiery entity operating in the nocturnal time frame of the 24-hour cycle a hunter, a divine killer, protector, and so forth. People, when you put on that panther skin, the panther itself, the baisa itself, and akan, baisa, or basa, becomes sa, ba, or sebo, reverse, or sebo means leopard, or sebo was the female leopard, and so forth. These are animal totems. These are achinebwa, a sacred animal totem. That means, just like you can be a child of a divinity, and carry the energy of the divinity of fire and so forth, if someone else is a child of a watery divinity, somebody else is a child of an earth divinity, plant life, animal life, mineral life, as well as Afurakani, Afurakani, human life, we are categorized according to the divinity of whom we are descended of, a child of a cell within that great organ. So you have plant life that are connected, plant totems, mineral totems, but you also have animal totems. Certain animals carry the energy of certain fiery divinity. So that uh, leopard, that basa, carries the energy of that fire, but it's that ba, that fire, that's contained within the sa, the sanctuary, it's operating within a container. It's the one in the nocturnal regions, that fire that lights your path in the darkness. Not only lights your path in the darkness, but you have that fire, you have that capacity to wage war to protect yourself, to attack your enemies, just like the uh, leopard does in the nighttime. The leopard has the capacity to, they, they live alone. They, have, they say they're very agile, of course, good swimmers. That's directly related to the, you know, um, the sacred rivers that you have to cross to get to the ancestral realm and so forth. Um, but they're, they're solitary. It's the difference between lions and lionesses and lion cubs. They live in a pride. They live in a big family. They're together most of the time and so forth. When a lion cub grows up, for example, a male lion cub, cub, cub grows up, they go out and seek a female. They establish a pride and so forth, and they live in that community. It's different with an osebo, a basa, a leopard. Once they grow up, become of age, and they strike out on their own, and they spend most of their time alone, most of their time in solitude. They hunt alone. 
They consume their food alone. Of course, they connect with the opposite sex when it's time to procreate, but they spend most of their time alone, of course, except for the females when they have, you know, the uh, leopard cubs and so forth, they take care of them. But once they get to a certain age, then they're alone. So you have a nocturnal entity operating in the nighttime in the darkness, has the fire, ba, the divine living, animating fire, ba, operating within that sanctuary in that container, sa, that fire lights the way through the nocturnal regions, the darkness, but that fire also is connected to that divine killing and hunting aspect. So any denizens of the underworld that would seek to pull you off your path, pull you off track, you have the firepower to rip them apart. You're solitary. You operate in solitude. You operate alone to the extent that when you have that panther skin on, it's representing the individual is responsible for their own spiritual development. The individual is responsible for their own spiritual cultivation. Yes, you can get advice. Yes, you can get some direction and some guidance from other individuals. Yes, you can invoke abosom and be replenished and so forth. But at the end of the day, you have to make decisions that direct the course of your life. It is, a part, it is your responsibility is your obligation, it is an ancestral mandate and a mandate from the abosom that govern your head to align your thoughts, intentions, and actions with the ka that's dwelling in your head region, the ka'et that's dwelling in your head region, called the kra and krawa and akan. That's that solitude we're talking about. So when the leopard skin is used by the sim priests, this is a reflection of the divine living energy by or ba operating within a container, lighting your way through the darkness. You can operate through the spirit realm, navigate your way through the spirit realm, the ancestral realm, the realm of the divinities as well, not succumb to negative influence and be, influences and be, become pulled away, but you can operate in a harmonious fashion. And you can protect yourself, defend yourself, and move forward and make your way through the darkness. And you are engaged in spiritual cultivation. You're utilizing your ba divine living energy within that container, sa, to empower yourself, connect with the abosom, connect with the nananoman samampo, you are taking responsibility for yourself. You need that kind of independent thought and action if you're going to be engaged in healing practices for other individuals. You have to be responsible. You can't be the kind of individual who always seeking some assistance from somewhere else you have to be responsible. You have to be solitary. You have to have mastered navigating through darkness, through the spirit realm, and coming out on the other side unscathed, having the capacity to wage war against those denizens of the spirit realm. And also, of course, in the physical world, when you move through, quote, unquote, darkness or dark times or dark periods, you don't have any fear because you're like the basa, the leopard. You are operate in solitude anyway operate in a solitary fashion, you have the power, the animate fire to make your way through any form of darkness and come out on the other side and so forth. When you can go through that kind of fire, then you're the type that can lead others to go through that kind of fire as well. When you have any kind of animal skin or utilizing any form of animal body parts and so forth, as we talked about in our previous broadcast dealing with mummification and divination, that skin itself, in this case, the basa, the leopard skin, it is a magnet for the abosom, a magnet for the nananoman samampo. For example, in our Khan tradition, the Brietuo clan, the Brietuo abusia, that particular matri clan, the achinebwa, the major achinebwa animal totem for that clan is Osebo, the leopard. People who are children of that matri clan, born into the world, connect to that matri clan, that energy of the basa or the osebo, as it's called in Akan, is carried within the matri clan and blood circle of these individuals. They carry that energy complex. They wield that kind of energy in the world. A leopard is like, or a female or male leopard is like their brother and sister carry. skin 
of course, in the uh, Khan tradition, Yoruba tradition, as well as Hudu and Juju and so forth in North America, if we did not have access to a leopard skin engaged in that ritual process, what you will see is them using efun or chidel, the white quote-unquote chalk, and drawing circles all over the body of the initiates, initiates and so forth. That is a replication of placing dots all, white dots all over the body of the initiate, male or female. That is a replication of that leopard skin. So when you see those white dots on the body, what you're looking at is the exact same sim priest or priest of Sashat in ancient Kemet with the leopard skin. We've replicated that process with the white chalk in these initiatory um, practices, still going in the same direction. So when you have a leopard skin on, you draw the energy of the Abosom and the Nananon Unsamon for the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors who are operating under the governance of that divinity that skin becomes a shrine or a magnifier of that divinity of energy. And once it's magnified, you're wrapped up in that skin, you become a magnet and like a battery for that divinity's energy. So therefore, you have the capacity and you expand upon and enlarge your capacity that you already contain innately, but you expand your body, your divine living energy to wield it in a fashion to assist others who need healing or direction. So when you see the Sim priest in ancient Kemet wearing the leopard skin engaged in the ceremony called the opening of the mouth and eyes, there's a reason for that. Now, the opening of the mouth and eyes, and we've dealt with this, we've published this before, we've done broadcasts on it, but just to recap, of course, in ancient Kemet, you will see the murals and so forth, the deceased uh, sovereign mummified and so forth, then you see the sim priests, they engage in a ritual process where they take certain instruments and open the mouth of the individual and place it on the eyes and so forth. And the text will say, open for me my mouth, give to me my mouth so I can speak with it, open to me my eyes so I can see with them. I now have power over my arms, power over my legs. I can operate and repel any, repulse any negative entities and I can move forward in the spirit realm. So, of course, that's talking about what's taking place after death on one, in one context, one aspect. When you transition, your spirit separates from your body, go through the funerary process, the body is buried and so forth. You spend, as we talked about the other night, in the Akan tradition, about 40 days within that 40 day Adadria 9, 42-day cycle calendar that we have, ritual calendar every 42 days is an ancestral observance. During that 42-day period, the spirit, the newly departed spirit, is spending time visiting family members, showing up in dreams, showing up at the house, showing up in different places, trying to console them, trying to get accustomed to this new condition that they're in, this new relationship, because now they're not going to be seeing one another physically anymore. They're going to be in the ancestral realm and visit every now and then. So people have to adjust, and they go through that process for the first 40 or so days. But then they begin to make that journey to the ancestral realm to dwell with the ancestral community and become firmly seated with their ancestresses and ancestors and spend most of their time with them. In the past, when they were living on Earth, they spent, of course, the vast majority of their time with their family members, but periodically during ritual, evocation of the Nsamanpo, the Nananom Nsamanpo, then the ancestors and ancestors come and dwell with the physical earthly community and there's a, a communion. And that happens periodically throughout the year, throughout the month, throughout the year. But they spend most of their time in the ancestral community. We spend most of our time focused on the physical earthly community. But during ritual spaces, whether you're pouring libation or going to your shrine or having a larger ritual, communal ritual and so forth, that's when you take time out of your regular physical earthly activities and you commune with the ancestral community. You spend most of your time here, but periodically you foray, foray into the ancestral community, ancestral realm. When you make your transition, that flips. You're going to be spending the vast majority of your time with the ancestors and ancestors who had gone before you in the ancestral community and periodically you foray into the physical world and through spirit possession or spirit communication or at the shrine to communicate with your living relatives on earth. 
that relationship flip or that new dynamic, that's an adjustment. And people start adjusting for the first 40 days, of course, the first seven days leading up to the funeral, the IEA, the funerary process, and then after that, the next 35 days and so forth. But then by the time a year passes, usually people say the person is firmly seated in the ancestral realm. But making your way to the ancestral realm, just like if you're walking through a, a bad neighborhood to get to your school or get to your job and so forth, there are individuals who didn't make it to the ancestral realm. They were repulsed from the ancestral realm, so they're like homeless people, just like physically homeless people, transients, hanging out on bridges or sidewalks and so forth, trying to grab at you, trying to influence you. Some maybe even try to rob you or try to physically assault you and so forth. You have to make it through those kind of individuals in your physical life, and you know how to do that. When you make a transition, there's a backlog of a number of individuals like that as well who repel from the ancestral community. You have to make it through those individuals who would seek to pull you in different directions, pull you away from your past, just like they tried to do when they were on earth. When they transitioned, they're the same way. So you operate and you move through so you can get to the ancestral realm. Sometimes they would tr seek to control you. So we have something preemptive for that. We know that this is what they would try to do. It's like you know going out you may get some mace or you may get another weapon or you may be prepared to know if I'm going in this area, this is what these individuals are going to try to do. I will be prepared for them. They're not going to control them. When you make a transition, we have something preemptive. In that sense, the opening of the mouth and eyes, that ritual prayer. So even if some try to latch on to you like a parasite spiritually in the spirit realm, you engage this ritual invocation, which invokes the forces in nature that govern you, stimulates your ba, your divine living energy, that's contained within that sanctuary of your spirit body, the sa. And the priest, the sim priest with the basa garment on, carrying the energy of the leopard, the basa, that nocturnal one who can help navigate through darkness, nocturnal regions, also has the power to rip apart and destroy the enemy. He can assist you or she can assist you in navigating your way through that harrowing journey from the physical world to the spirit realm to repel your enemies, destroy your enemies, uh, burn up your enemies so you can get through and if one of them tries to latch on and attack and attach themselves and hinder your forward movement, then you engage in that ritual invocation. If you're not aware or you're not feeling it, then the priest doing the invocation here in the physical world but traveling through the spirit realm with you, then it can affect that result. And that invocation allows you to connect your divine living energy with the energy of the abosom, and you can repel those negative spirits, and they won't be able to control your mouth or your invocation. They won't be able to control your eyes, and you won't, because up until that point, they would try to control your direction, blind you from your path and so forth. They will try to control your arms and legs. You can't move forward. You're being controlled just like somebody trying to run up on you on the street and grab you and kidnap you and throw you, tie you up and throw you in a car and so forth. Those same kind of individuals will try the same thing. So these invocations repel these perverse spirits, repel them with ease, and then you can move forward to the ancestral realm. This happens on a regular basis, and because we've experienced this, we have measures to deal with it effectively. We've been doing this for thousands of years. But it's not just only the after-death state, it's also during the ritual state here in the physical world two major ways you enter into the ancestral realm in the physical world. One is the ritual state. You engage in ancestral religious practice. But you also have the dream state. So when you fall asleep, now you can see on the mundane level, on the earthly level, how this ritual invocation works as well. In the hoodoo tradition, for example, when someone sleeps, white and offspring will call it sleep paralysis. And that does occur physiologically, but we're not talking about this happening when it's physiological, but we're talking about spiritual. In the hoodoo tradition, they'll talk about a witch is riding someone, sitting on the person's chest, so you're asleep, you're in the dream state, all of a sudden you feel a heaviness on your chest, the body, 
you can't move, you can barely breathe, you can't move your arms, you can't move your legs, you try to scream, try to yell, you can't open your mouth, you can't release the sound, you can't open your eyes even though you're struggling to open your eyes. Some people are engaged in this nightly battle to the extent that they wake up and they're sweating and tired every night because they've been fighting this battle. When you engage the ritual process, you're practicing the hoodoo tradition of juju of Odun and so forth, when that happens and you know what's taking place, someone sent a negative discarnate spirit to influence you, assault you, try to control you and so forth, you engage this ritual practice, this invocatory practice. When you begin the invocation, it repels these discarnate spirits. It repels these negative entities. When the text says, give to me my mouth so I can speak with it, open my eyes so I can see, give me the power to set him over my arms and legs so I can move once again, once you engage these ritual invocations, release these ritual invocations, then you repel those spirits and you are able to open your eyes now. You are able to open your mouth. You are able to move your arms and legs and you're able to be free once again. The opening of the mouth and eyes happens after death. The opening of the mouth and eyes happens during the dream state as well as the ritual state because sometimes people go into the ritual state, spirit possession occurs. If you're in harmony with order and you're dealing in a harmonious fashion, only the abosome, the forces in nature, as well as the spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors of your blood circle will possess. If you are out of harmony with order and you opened up a wide uh, openings within your spirit body, within your kahibit, your so-called aura, and it becomes porous because you've been operating in a disharmonious fashion, in a discarnate spirit that would normally not be able to attach themselves to you. Normally you would be able to repel them with ease. They can attach themselves, even possess, or at least attach themselves to the extent that they can control your movements and controlling your, your thoughts and so forth. And now you're being assaulted, no different than if your immune system is compromised than the microbes and viruses and so forth that normally bounce right off of you when you're walking down the street or people coughing and so forth. You have no problem. You repel them with ease. You don't even have to think about it. Your immune system is working properly. You're repelling it. But if your immune system is compromised because of what you've been doing, then those weak viruses, viral agents, bacteria can assault you and take you down, and next thing you know, you're laid out in bed with the flu, aches and pains, can't move well, and everything else. The same thing happens spiritually. If your spiritual immunity is compromised, if it's, if it's strong, you can repel negative, weak entities with ease without even thinking about it because your aura is so powerful and vibrant and bright, it repels them. They can't even get close. But if your spiritual immunity is compromised because you've been engaged in self-destructive behavior, disaligned from your kra, your krawa, engaged in drug use or self-destructive activity or dishonesty or promiscuity or all kinds of nonsense, then you weaken your spiritual immunity and these weak, parasitic, bacterial, viral-type discarnate spirits can attach themselves and try to control you. Therefore, you engage in a normal ritual practice that you would normally do and possession occurs or a mild possession occurs, not from an honored ancestor ancestors, from one of these weak, criminal, discarnate spirits. But when you engage the ritual invocatory process, you can repel them. And once you repel them and you get to a safe space, you, you can begin to work on yourself, cultivate yourself, fortify yourself, and so forth. So this is what's taking place when you see uh, the seven priests arrayed in this ritual um, garment. It is the body of the animal totem, carries the energy of the abosom that gives him the power to expand his body energy so he can repel, destroy discarnate entities, navigate his way through the nocturnal regions and so forth, and assist others in the same process. So when you look at the term sim in ancient Kemet, if you look at the definitions of sim, First and foremost, it means to bless one who blesses as a title of priests, uh, one of the priest class in ancient Kemet. It means to bless. It also means an image or a likeness. And, of course, that priest or priestess becomes an image or a likeness in this sense, the uh, ritual context. 
they become a vessel for the abosom to be possessed by the divinity. They become that form or likeness of the divinity. That's why sim also means likeness. Sim also means an action or a custom, a deed or an undertaking, a ritual deed or a ritual custom. Sim means to pile offerings upon an altar. It also means herbs or vegetables and so forth. In this context, ritual offerings and so forth. So sim meaning to bless, sim meaning form, image, or likeness. That's talking about blessing. In this context, when they say blessing, it's talking about ritual invocation. It's talking about a form or likeness. Sim means taking the form or likeness of the ancestral spirit of the divinity, meaning through spirit possession. Sim being a title of that form of priest or priestess. Sim being a deed or undertaking in this ritual context, ritual practices of a priest or priestess. Herbs or vegetables being related to the ritual offerings to the divinity. Sim meaning to pile offerings upon an altar. Ritually, of course, so that term sim for the sim priest, it includes all these different aspects. So when you see these different definitions in the hieroglyphic dictionary, they can't unify those different definitions, but these are different um, expressions of the function of that uh, sacerdotal office. Of course, sim dealing with ritual, ritual invocation, service to a divinity, and all of that, that term is uh, pronounced sum in the Akan tradition, so the Osum people, the Osumfo, I mean Osum people are the servants, the attendants. It can be on the mundane level of servant of a king or queen, mother or, or so, or Hini or Hema and so forth, but in the ritual context, the service of Anabosa, the service of the Nananom and Sumanfo. So Osumfo means the group of people fo who engage the Sum function. It's like Akanfo means the group of people fo who are Akan or Kufo are the group of people fo who engage the ku function, which is to fight or battle. So they're warriors. Warrior says the osumfo are the people who engage the sum function. The group of people fo who engage the sum function. The osumfo, that class of ritual uh, specialists, servants of divinities and so forth. The osum individual is the same sim priest or priestess from ancient Kemet with the same function, the same ritual function, and so forth, guiding people through these ritual practices. Now, we read that section from Unas. Uh, there was a particular section, which we can read as well, in the Pert Imheru, and it talks about what has taken place after that opening of the mouth during that process. One of the ritual invocations says, my mouth is opened by the top. Oh. Induces I am Sekhmet Wachet who dwells in the west of heaven. I am Sahi amongst the souls of Anu. So they're talking about once Pata, the fashion of divine fashion of creation, opens the mouth of the individual. He looses the bonds that set head over his mouth. Tuhuti comes fully equipped with the Hekau, divine words of power, the so-called invocations and so forth. The deity of divine wisdom comes forward. After the mouth is open, he gives you those divine hekal, divine words of power. That's why they say Tuhuti has come fully equipped with spells or ritual invocations. They say spells. Sometimes they'll translate it as magic. But we're talking about ritual invocations. Tuhuti, the spokesperson of Amen and Amenet, Ron Wright, the supreme being, as well as the creator and creatress. Of course, the creator and creatress, Ron Wright, are grandchildren of the supreme being, Amenet and Amen. He comes fully equipped. He's the spokesperson, the mouthpiece of the divinity, and therefore he comes fully equipped with those ritual invocations. Once your mouth is open and he gives you those ritual invocations, you can utilize those effectively to repel, destroy this kind of spirit who would seek to cause you problems. The bonds are set, are loosened from the mouth. Atem in my hand. Atem is the one who finishes creation. He's the finisher, the one who completes. He operates with the red setting sun that sets and completes the day. 
and that red sun goes into the earth. And Tim also means red setting sun, but it also means a hard compact substance because when the red setting sun penetrates the earth, then it hardens that earth. It's a completion um, of finishing and so forth. Uh, Tim has that power. He has given me my hand. They are placed as guardians. Now you have movement of the hands. Remember when you talk about uh, a witch riding you or a spirit sitting on the chest, you know, during that whole um, process, during the sleep state, that ritual state, or even in the ritual state when some spirit is trying to control you. Uh, Tim, after the opening of the mouth and the ritual invocations are um, spoken, those ritual invocations given by Tehuti, now the power that Tim has, gives you that power in your hands, and they are placed as guardians. Now you can move your hands. Of course, you can move your legs. You have that freedom. Your mouth is open. You can repel these negative spirits and so forth, and you can move forward. We, even when we talked about in the beginning, the title of the show, Ojida, purification. We say purification operationalizes Nana Song. Purification operationalizes ancestral religion. Of course, Nana Song means Song, the service of Nana, which is Nana Inyamewa, Nana Inyame, Nana Inyokumpon, Nana Inyokuton, the Nana Noma, and some the Nana Noma, Bosun, Nina, the deities. That title, Nana, is an honorific title. So when we say Nana Som, it means to serve some Nana. And that service, once again, is Som, to serve as in the Osomfo, those who are servants or attendants to the deities and the spiritually cultivated ancestors and his ancestors. That's why we use the term Nana Som for ancestral religion. It is the service sum of Nana, of the great God, the great goddess, the creator, the great trust, the deity, the ancestral spirits which are spiritually cultivated. All of them carry the title Nana, so we serve Nana. So that's why we call it Nana Song. But again, Pata opens the mouth to who he has the ritual invocations. Once those are spoken, the bonds are freed from the mouth. Um, the power is given back into the hands and the limbs and so forth. And now the person can operate harmoniously once again and continue to execute their function. This is what we're talking about with regard to, this is all tied to um, the functioning of the sim priest as well as those who wear the basa garment, the, literally the panther skin or that entity. And once you're wrapped in that entity, whether you're wearing the panther skin itself which is a ritual item that carries the energy of that divinity, or if it's replicated through ritual processes, that sacred chalk that's empowered with the uh, sekim, the power of the divinities, the tumia, the ashe of the divinities, and once it's placed on the body in those sacred circles or dots and so forth, you have replicated that panther skin and you draw that abosom to you so you can operate through the nocturnal regions and spiritual realm you can protect yourself, defend yourself, and you can carry that divine living energy to navigate your way through without harming yourself and so forth. This is where this whole notion of the sacredness of the panther comes from. And so you see that priest not only with the panther skin, but even the head of the panther is still, of course, connected to the skin that is part of the garment. Now you have the pseudo-panther, created by Cracker Stan Lee and Jack Kirby or, or John Kirby, whatever the name of the Cracker is, back in the 60s, and they're making up a little storyline. And the storyline is based on elements from our culture that are corrupted. So you're going to have millions and millions of black people spending tens of millions of dollars giving that money that's primarily going to benefit the whites and their offspring, and even the few little black actors who are there, these are not individuals who are culturally grounded. So when they spend the millions that they make as millionaires for these films, they'll turn right around and spend that money right back in the white community, supporting white, uh, the white economy, as well as white ideas, white culture, and so forth. There was some information posted previously when they're talking about they're introducing dissexuality, homosexuality. Of course, that's the major reason they're putting the film out. 
so they can promote that as a normative value, the insanity of dissexuality, homosexuality, which is always perverse in any form or fashion whatsoever. It is the nature of the whites and their offspring. It is insane. It is hated by the abosom, the forces of nature, hated by the supreme being, the great mother, great father, hated by the nanonoman samampo, hated by your own ka, and ka, your own soul, always has, always will be. It's no different than bestiality or pedophilia. They are all in the same constellation. So, of course, the Whites and their offspring are going to use this quote-unquote blockbuster film to promote that insanity and generally to promote white culture in general. Everything they do is political. And we need to understand that. When you have a nationist perspective, an Amanier perspective, a grounded, purified perspective, you understand that your enemy, spirits of disorder, the Whites and their offspring, incarnated spirits of disorder, anything they put forward, is always a manifestation of disorder. They will only seek to promote disorder that is their nature. And if you embrace what they put forward, you are seeking to embrace disorder. It's no different than trying to consume poison and then wondering what the problem is. So this is what they're putting forward, some fictional superhero and heroines and so forth, but what we should be doing, and of course we have our poor trois, our challenge, we're working on our documentary film, of course, and we started that process last year. It's been almost a year and so forth. We're talking about real, not superheroes, but super heroes. Not super heroines, but super het heroes. Our ancestresses and ancestors who actually freed our people from enslavement, the worst condition we could possibly be in. Certain groups of our people wage war against the whites and their offspring. We talked about Okufo Yao, Nat Turner. We talked about Okufo Kwabena, Denmark Vesey. We talked about Nana Abena, Araminta, Harriet Tubman. We talked about a number of different individuals, Okufo Geb, Gabriel Prosser, and so forth, a number of different individuals who wage war, plan insurrections and so forth against the whites and their offspring to force the end of enslavement. We talk about the Gullah Wars, which forced the United States into the Civil War. Then thousands of our people got into that fight as well, that chance to get armed so they can kill as many crackers as possible. They made the difference. It was forced by the Gullah Wars against the United States Army. So we talk about our people who maintain their ancestral religious practices and through the specific forms of oracular divination in the hoodoo tradition, which is Akan, juju tradition, which is Yoruba, voodoo tradition, which is Ebe and Fong, wanga tradition, which is Obambo Gullah, Ngengan tradition, which is Fang. We're focusing on these five traditions, myself, as well as voodoo queen Kalinda Laveau, and Mama Mawusi Ashakir, and Rekit Kajara Niaya Nebethet, and Seshat Tut Ankwajet, she's a Wabet priestess as well. We, of our various traditions, we're dealing with the divination systems we've preserved in our blood circles intergenerationally in this hemisphere in our traditions. We'll be talking about those oracular divination systems, which empowered and guided our people towards overcoming the worst condition imaginable, which is enslavement. And our ancestresses and ancestors did that. And of course, after enslavement, those who were grounded within our ancestral clans, they moved forward to establish and begin that whole black town, black independent black town movement where there were hundreds of independent black towns. The whites and their offspring only want to focus on those black towns that were destroyed by the whites and their offspring, like Black Wall Street or Rosewood. But there were many other black towns that were not destroyed by the whites and their offspring because those people were armed and killed crackers. So the crackers knew not to go. Even prior to the end of enslavement, Dismal Swamp, at some point over a couple of thousand people living in the area, they lived intergenerationally during enslavement because they freed themselves and established an independent nation in the Virginia, North Carolina area. And when the whites and offspring sent in the military to try to drag those people back into enslavement, those people had formed a formidable army and defeated the whites and offspring to the extent that the whites and offspring started seeking peace treaties and started trying to trade with the people in Dismal Swamp. 
So while they're, they were living in Dismal Swamp, raising children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so forth, there were other people on plantations still enslaved. But they freed themselves, powered by ancestral religion. The same is true of the Gullah in the Gullah region and so forth in Florida and South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, different places. But during that particular time around the Florida region, they developed their own independent nation and they were waging war against the United States Army. The White Snarl Spring don't talk too much about that because it's too empowering for our people. Of course, they don't talk about even after the end of the Civil War that we prompted, forced into existence because of our warfare. They don't want to talk about those independent black towns. There were hundreds of black towns, independent black towns that were actually successful that lasted up until the so-called 20th century. And there are a few that still exist right now. They don't want to talk about those because that's empowering. That's a line of dissent or a circle of dissent for certain people who maintain ancestral religious practices. You can see a direct line of their success. You have some people with integrationists going back during enslavement all the way up until now. Their, their legacy is trying to force people to embrace integration, and we're still suffering under the whites and their offspring. You have certain people who are black nationalists, secular nationalists, or some who are black nationalists in some way connected to Christianity or some uh, pseudo-white religion and so forth, the legacy of the traditional nationalists or secular nationalists is impotence because they have never achieved the goals that they are seeking to achieve and not close to achieving those goals. That goes from prior to slavery being abolished up until this moment. But then you have another line of dissent of those who maintain their ancestral religious practices ever since they arrived on these shores. Those were the people who were empowered and guided by their oracular divination systems, communicating with the Abosom and Ensemanfo, Orisha and Egungun, Vodou and Kuvito and so forth, on the best means by which to wage war against the whites and their offspring and free themselves from enslavement, and they freed themselves in their lifetime established independent settlements in their lifetimes, raised children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren in their lifetimes. Those are the people who also prompted the Gullah Wars, the Hoodoo Wars, and so forth, forced the Civil War, and forced the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere. Those are the people who then moved forward to establish independent black towns. We are descended from that lineage. That's the model that we follow because it's a successful model. We don't follow the unsuccessful models that's based on Eurocentric philosophy, whether it's integration or secular nationalism or nationalism grounded in Christianity or Islam or some form of that. Those two sides of the same coin are a coin that has not been successful, didn't result in success, and would not result in any success that we're looking for but we're following the model that yielded results from the beginning. If you, if you arrived here and you ended up in chains, your first order of business is to get out of chains and have your independent nation. Our people did that. The integrationists didn't do that. They, they remained on the plantations until the Civil War came along. The next order of business, once you freed yourself from plantations, to assist others and free, help them become free from those plantations which we engage that process as well. The next order of business is to realize that you have to liberate the entire continent. It wasn't just an island that we had to take over. There's an entire continent. Wherever the people were, we had to end the entire institution. So we had to wage multiple wars and force through the Gullah Wars and Hutu Wars, the coming into being of the Civil War, to force the end of enslavement totally. We achieved that as well. And then after that, of course, people are trying to get us into sharecropping and all other kinds of economic schemes. The intelligence, um, intelligence amongst us, guided by our Insamampo, guided to a certain region of the Earth Mother in the western part of her body in this region, we began to establish independent black towns and do things for ourselves independent. That was successful as well. And now we are here to complete the process. We need to follow a successful model. And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about our film, Mpoa Chua. Mpoa Chua is not the film. That means challenge. The film is Amaru Kapo Adebisa Ajumadi, 
African American Ancestor Divination Project. But the important, the challenge is are we going to support the nonsense of the white snare offspring, the propaganda of the white snare offspring in blackface, or pseudo fictional superheroes, or we're going to support super heroes and super het heroes? This is the challenge, and this is the challenge just across the board. Starve the beast and feed the pride, which is part of our Okom economic Devel development model operation. Every week we make an assessment on what funds we would have potentially wasted with the whites in our spring, and then we starve the beast and feed the pride. We redirect those funds to a black business organization or institution. If you're going to spend $10 at Walmart or 7-Eleven, you take that $10 and redirect it to a black business organization or institution that is providing the same service or product. We make that simple decision. The $20 billion that we spend weekly as a community, as a black Oman and nation, we can take at least 10% of that $20 billion. That means 10% of the money that you spend on a weekly basis. If you spend a couple of hundred dollars over the course of a week, you can decide I'm going to take 10% of that, and instead of spending the whole $200 this week at the businesses I normally spend them at, I'm going to take 10% of it and redirect that $20 to a black business organization or institution. When all of our people engage that process, we will take $2 billion a week, redirect that $2 billion away from the pockets of our enemies, the whites and our spring, and into black businesses. That will allow the 2 million black businesses in America each to hire one individual for $50,000 a year. We can solve the unemployment problem where there are 2 million black people unemployed. We can solve that overnight by each black business is hiring you one black person. There are 2 million black businesses in the United States. If each person hires one black person, all black people will be employed. We can do that simply by shifting the money we're already spending, 10% of it on a weekly basis from white businesses to a black business. If we do not do that, then we're already making the decision that we decide that we would rather support our absolute enemies, these criminals, the whites and their offspring, and to hell with black businesses. We would rather employ white Asians, white Hindus, white Arabs, white Americans, white Europeans, white Hispanics, white pseudo-Native Americans, we'll rather empower them with a job for $50,000 a year, and they give us the nigger treatment on a regular basis. We'll rather give them funds instead of funding our own people. That, that is insane. So, Okom Economic Development, that's our model, that operation, we engage that process on a weekly basis all year long. It's not just during the quote-unquote Christmas season, all year long. You identify at least 10% or more of the funds you would have spent with the whites and offspring and redirect them to the business organization or institution of the week. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about the Mpua challenge. We have that challenge. We see people supposedly culturally grounded, making plans, making elaborate plans to go spend millions of dollars to see a movie. That's not going to yield any kind of benefit for the community. You can get the movie on bootleg if you want to. Of course, it's going to be on the Internet the next day. Somebody's going to post it on Facebook. But the key is we should be shifting millions of dollars to our own people. We can build hospitals, schools, stores, and everything else with the millions of dollars. We spend over a billion dollars on movies alone in the black community on a yearly basis. What can we do with a billion dollars? We're feeding white nonsense on a yearly basis. We could be opening up grocery stores in every black neighborhood. We could be empowering and hiring black people permanently with high salaries on a yearly basis where they never working for a black business where they never are concerned about losing their employment because the funds that we spend, over one trillion dollars that we have coming through our hands, 950 plus billion go right to the whites in our spring and the other 50 billion we spend, spend amongst ourselves, which is insane. So this is what we're talking about with the Mpua the challenge. We started our process with regard to our film, the crowdfunding effort last January. So in about a week, that'll be like the one-year anniversary. We are at 49% right now. 
of our crowdfunding goal. We had about 95 contributors so far over the course of the past 12 months. Some of them have given twice, three times. Some have given like four or five times over the past, the past 12 months. So you'll see on the site, the fundraising effort, you'll see it's 164 contributors or 165 contributors uh, contributions, but it's really about 95 people, 96 people. Um, but some have given more than once, so that means it's 165 or so contributions that allowed us to reach our 49% just the other day. In fact, early this morning, we hit like 49% of the funding goal. Once we reach 100%, then we can uh, finish complete the film within the next 30 days, and we would like to have it out before the spring, which is very doable because 95 people, that's a small amount. As we said earlier, we have about 347 people or 350 people now who follow us on the Blog Talk channel alone. So within that group, we can reach 95 people in that group, once again, making a uh, contribution. If 95 people got us to 49%, 95 people, additional people can get us to uh, 100% in, in a few minutes if everybody went to the site. So anybody who can assist in that effort, we would like to release the film um, prior to the beginning of spring. And it's very doable. We just need that assistance from the community. So if you go to the fundraiser site on our Website, Amaru Kapo Adebisa Adjumadi. You see that on the website. You see that on the piece for the show. We want to say yerase to those who have uh, contributed recently over the past couple of days. Over the past eight days, we had um, eight, con or uh, over the past seven days, we had eight contributions. Eight different individuals uh, contributed to the fund. It was about a uh, contribution per day. But we do have not only 350 around that on our Blog Talk radio channel. We have thousands of people download the books on a monthly basis, about 4,000 book downloads, free book downloads on a monthly basis. We just posted this notification showing that we had 55,000 books, uh, free books downloaded over the past 12 months. So, well, from September to September, because that's our new year, from September 22nd to September 22nd, we, we calculate based on that. We don't calculate from January 1st to January 1st. Our new year is the equinox, so that's when we start counting. So between the September and September 22nd um, of the previous year to this year, um, we had over 55,000 downloads of our free books. And that's all, of course, in this country and worldwide. So we're getting the word out, but we do need the assistance of those who actually embrace the work. We see what other individuals are doing. Of course, some people... We would expect just based on conditioning at this point in their lives that they're going to go out and spend millions of dollars to support uh, white producers and who are multimillionaires and a few black actors and actresses who are millionaires who will, of course, reinvest that money, the vast majority of it, right back into the white community. Of course, a sizable percentage of our people who are in that mindset state right now they are waiting right now. They are saving up their money, and they are planning to, plotting and planning to give their money to white people. They can't wait to give their money to white people next month. Those of us who are culturally grounded, we should know better by now. Of course, when you look on uh, things like Facebook and other, other social media, you'll find that some people that you thought were very grounded are also waiting with bated breath to give millions of dollars to our enemies. They will talk about our enemies all day online and talk about the whites in their offspring or banging on the beast or whatever, and economic development. But you'll see those same individuals looking forward to giving up their funds to the enemy. And the enemy is sitting there watching us, especially the people who are culturally grounded, talking about stuff all year online, but they can't wait to walk up into their presence and give them millions of dollars, and they're, of course, going to receive it, and they realize that they are still in control. So those of us who are culturally grounded, we should know better than that. We should know that we, when we're promoting anything that's teaching, it should be something that's actually teaching, that's something that's actually benefiting people. 
when we deal with ancestral religious reversion or cultural re reversion, we're talking about transforming behavior. People get back involved in ancestral religion. We have methods where they, through their own volition, self-help, um, using our Akumasa method, the Kum method within Akumasa, overcoming addiction to drugs and alcohol, cigarettes and so forth, people overcoming those negative the negative draw to domestic violence situations, drawing the same kind of people in their lives and cutting that off so they can have healthy relationships and not deal with that nonsense anymore. People dealing with intergenerational and transcarnational trauma, engaging the ritual process to overcome that so they can move forward in their lives. People becoming entrepreneurs, transforming their diets, transforming their interactions with their spouses, their children, and so forth engaging the nation-building process, people being inspired to study and, and begin to publish things like that and informing the community and also becoming entrepreneurs. This is what happens when people study real information and they can activate it, actualize it. That's a benefit to the community. Spending money on some white movie with black people in it is a benefit to our enemies. For those who are supportive of the work, please go today. And this is part of a fundraising effort we said on the other piece is the final push towards completion of the film. We certainly have more than 95 individuals who support the work because, as proven, we have thousands of downloads, tens of thousands of downloads of our free books per year. So we definitely have more than 95 individuals in the course of one year, which is, you know, less than 10 people per month, um, basically or basically it was basically on average eight people a month or two people a week and so forth who contributed over the course of a year. We definitely have more than that. And when we look at and just juxtapose what we're doing with regard to the whites and their offspring, especially a film like this that has no value whatsoever, we can definitely shift some of the funds away from that to support a real film dealing with real issues that actually will empower our people. So, we're going to take some calls on the phone line. If, if you have any questions or comments on the phone line, you can hit the number one. Uh, if you have any questions or comments in the chat room, you have to log in as a user in order to interact. And we're not going to go on too much longer. We, um, it's about 1030 now. Okay, Michelle on the phone line, number 8162. You had a question or a comment? What's up? What's up? Um, I had a question about the Raet Part 3 broadcast. Say it again. I had a question about the Raet Part 3 broadcast from, um, I believe it was last Tuesday. Oh, okay. Um, you spoke about how um, men and recognize the value of um, Afrikaani women by allowing their radiance to empower and eliminate them without seeking to possess. And I was wondering what that actually looks like in reality. From, from my own experience in relationships, I would observe me compliment interacting with women in ways that I perceive to be inappropriate, or in your words, it appeared to me that he was attempting to possess other women, even though he was married to me. He wouldn't be doing anything blatantly disrespectful, but to me, his behavior had subtle nuances that made me feel like he was seeking more of a friendship. And when I would confront him about it, I would be accused of being insecure and jealous and seeking to control him. And in almost every situation, after the fact, I would find out that my first reaction was correct. And then I would be accused of, or he would say that I pushed him in the direction of this other woman by, by being insecure and jealous. And so, of course, that wasn't, you know, what I wanted, I wanted to be joined with someone and allow them to be who they were outside of me, and I wanted to be allowed the same thing. But, you know, because of the culture that we live in, the lines of what's appropriate and what's inappropriate behavior between men and women, 
you know, it's just so blurred. I'm not sure what I'm looking at anymore. And sometimes when I see what I think is a man attempting to possess a woman, I can't really even describe it except to say it just feels like that's what's going on or that's the vibe that I feel. So in balance, what does it look like in real time when a man is simply recognizing or appreciating the value of another woman what well, the last part you were getting a little uh muffle you said it, what does it look like and what did you say after that in balance what does it look like when a man is you know sincerely recognizing or appreciating the value of a woman without trying to possess her okay so for example um and, and Everything you said is accurate because you're dealing, you were, you were talking about a specific situation where the individual is just simply disordered and dishonest. And your cra, of course, picked up on that, and then later on it will later be confirmed. So, yeah, when somebody's being dishonest, I mean, they're just lustful and being, you know, a clown. So that, that's the key. The, the point of that broadcast is showing not only is it possible to benefit from the radiance of an Afro-Ikaiti woman, that's, it's normal and it's abnormal. In this culture, it's normal to lust after everybody and try to seek to possess everybody. Rich showing the difference. That is not normal behavior. That's abnormal behavior. Everything that they promote is normal here, whether it's this sexuality or anything else. Of course, that has nothing to do with us. So we, we have to show what the standard of what being normal is. So, for example, you attended the Hudu Mind, Hudu Nation Festival, you saw, you know, presentations and so forth. You, you just like you benefited from seeing, you know, Sister Afia Asase Bretuo talking about the Asumai and the talismans. So she gives a brilliant presentation um, and did the same thing at the Hudumayan Festival this year as well. We benefited from that as well, the males and the females. I, I benefited immensely from what she had to say and it inspired me to do even more research. That radiance that she, you know, emanated, it had nothing to do with me seeking to possess her. I just benefited from what she had, and I was able to move forward and do certain things. When you look at the article that we put forward, or if you, for example, some people read the Himatin Toro, the wife of the God, um, you know, the restoring the value of the Afro-Ikani priestess article. We did a broadcast on that. We did a series of uh, articles on the nature of Hetheru and her functioning creation, whether she's uh, Nebit Amentet, the mistress or mistress of the um, ancestor realm, the first entity you meet when you make your transition and what her function is in that regard, or her functioning with regard to the fusion of complementary opposites, not just anybody, but complementary opposites, and she doesn't fuse together people who are out of harmony with order. Of course, she doesn't fuse together you know, crackers and, you know, dissexuality, but even those of us who are out of harmony with, you know, our function, she doesn't fuse that together. She only fuses together complementary opposites in harmony with order. So those specific things and certain examples, people benefited from those articles, or they benefited from the uh, four-part series we did on the female divinity bats. A lot of people responded to that and said it really hit home. They had a connection with Bass, but this was the first time they had some real information, and it really benefited them. And all of those different publications, as we posted on Facebook, were the result of simply communicating with the sister, one sister in particular, and because of her radiance, she just, you know, releases that kind of energy that showcases certain kinds of quality. And then you can learn from that, and the result of that was a series of articles which led to a series of broadcasts that impacted right now. Even the articles themselves had over, at the time, over 1,400 views, and then the broadcasts themselves have a few thousand views, so it's impacting thousands of people simply by interacting with somebody who has a natural radiance because they're seeking to live in harmony with order, and that radiance is manifest, and then you benefit from that without seeking to possess the individual. And that's the evidence of that is the positive impact it's had on thousands of people, just a basic interaction without seeking to possess the individual. So it looks like that's how it looks. Um, but, it, of course, people have to be involved in embracing their ancestral culture. If they're embracing white cultures, these Negroes are just lusting. 
They're just imitating the whites and their offspring. And then they're going to be dishonest about it. But then the, key, the most important part of what you said is you were able to attune to that. Your cry showed you that, and then it was confirmed later, no matter what the individual said, the confirmation came that your cry was correct the whole time. So the next step is when your cry is correct and you, you learn how your cry communicates with you and you get used to it, like, oh, this is, you know, the cry telling me something. You don't have to wait for the individual to lie and try to, you know, weave out of the situation. You don't have to wait for none of that. Once your crowd shows you, then you cut them off and you move forward because you know your crowd's never leading you in the wrong direction. Confirmation can come later or it don't have to come because you don't, you're not dependent on these clowns anyway. You just move forward. You let your crowd guide you, your insurmountable guide you, and that's the key. Because it's operant within you, what, what if it wasn't operant within you and you couldn't see that? You would have, you know, fallen into even more despair or some other negative situation because your crowd wasn't, you know, as operant that you could feel it, but it was. So that's, that's the good thing that you can hold on to and build from. So that, that's the key. Ashe, what I say. Okay, Yeni I say that. We appreciate the call. Give me one second. Uh, we have a couple of more phone calls. Um, um, okay, Michelle, we're on the phone line number 1768. If you had a question or a comment. What's up, Brother Quasi? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Um, I, I have a question. Um, do you have in any of your... Um, your publications or, or, or previous broadcasts, have you spoke on the um, the Kaaba, that uh, the Black Stone in Mecca? Have you spoke on that at all? Uh, I haven't. I haven't dedicated an entire broadcast to it. Um, I'm pretty sure I recall whether it was a blog talk radio broadcast or um, maybe even one of the Ustream broadcasts a few years back. I do remember it, uh, touching on it briefly, but I didn't do anything um, in particular. But that notion of uh, black stone, quote-unquote black stone worship, um, that's not, you know, particular to Mecca. That's uh-huh. all over the place. It's always all over the place. So the origin of it you'll find in Kemet, in the temple of the, or the Het Ben Ben, or the temple of the Ben Ben stone and so forth, that black, sometimes they'll say it's a meteoric stone, but that it's representative of the primordial black mound that the Ben Ben, or the Bendu bird, the Ba of Atem, um, flew across the primordial waters and dwelt upon that original primordial black mound that rose up out of the primordial waters, which became the first landmass of Earth, they call it the Ben Ben Stone or the Sun Stone and so forth. It carries the divine living energy of Ra and Ra'at and so forth. That's where it comes. It's a shrine for the Bendu bird. It's a shrine for Atem. It's also a shrine for Ra and Ra'at. So just like we have shrines for different Orisha or Abosom and so forth, that's a shrine for Uduman Koma, which is in Akan or Atem, Atem Kopa, or Atem Kepra and Ancient Kemet, as well as Ra and Ra'at. And that, you'll find that in Ancient Kemet, but then you'll find it in you know, places like Hanana, so-called Phoenicia, you find it in Mecca that's pre-Islamic, and then later mm-hmm. on they continue uh, the little shrine, but then they, you know, build the whole nonsensical little ritual around it and start talking about it, it has something to do with a fictional cartoon character, Muhammad, who never existed. So um, that, that's, that's the basis of it. Okay, okay. Um, uh but you, you can't recall the, the broadcast like right from the top of your head, right? Um, no, but but I, w- I would have said something similar. We didn't, like, uh, spend too much time on it. I just uh, went into that that kind of detail. That was, I'm sure that was about it because we didn't focus, you know, in detail. It was probably yeah. just a question somebody asked similar to this one. Um, but if you want to learn more about the the Bindu birds, the Bindu stone, and that the information in the coffin text associated with that, our book, Odu Mankuma, Atem Kopa, talking about Atem and Kepra, that particular book, uh-huh. um, 
talks about Atem and Kepra. And it talks about the Ben Ben Stone, the Ben Bird, and the whole cosmology and all of that. So just know that when we're talking about the Ben Ben Stone and the Ben Bird and the Primordial Mound and the Black mm-hmm. Pyramidion, that's the capstone of the pyramid and all of that, that is the same as the quote unquote Black Stone in Mecca. Okay. I, I have two more quick questions. Um, what is, is um, Wallace Buzz like a, a good author to uh, uh, look towards, like getting books for like uh, Egyptian text? You said in books like the, say it again? Wallace Buzz, is he a good author to look, look to uh, getting information for, for like uh, Egyptian texts, like uh, the pyramid text or whatever? Uh, the the reason to use like a say for example Budge's hieroglyphic dictionary a two volume set is very extensive as far as you know they were going around to all the different temples and shrines and everything else um, getting all these glyphs and collecting them and putting them all in one place and then they all the good thing about the book is he has references to wherever they found the glyph they have a reference for where where it is what temple it's in you know where it is where you can actually go and find it. Um, So that dictionary is out there. And then, you know, Gardner and Alan, other people have dictionaries, the Vigas dictionaries online. So you can have all of those and compare them. There are certain things, like, for example, in the Vigas dictionary, a few of them um, entries that Budget's dictionary doesn't have, but then there are some entries that Budget's dictionary has that the Vigas dictionary does not have. So, um, So one thing with regard to those kind of references, they have a direct reference. Okay. You can utilize them for us specifically. We can look at that dictionary. You can look at the references and go to the primary text and so forth. And the primary text, you'll find them. Like if they say, hey, this word you can find in the pyramid text of Unas, the pyramid text of um, Neferkara, Kepi II, the pyramid text of Meri, Mer Enra, the pyramid text of Teti, and they'll tell you the specific utterance. Then when you go to the primary text of each one of those kings, you will find the actual term that he says. So you, you can verify that for yourself so they have good references there. But for us specifically, we can look at that dictionary, but then we can confirm it because we can look at the Akan Asante Fanti dictionary and find the exact mm-hmm. same words with the exact same meanings with the proper vocalizations. So we can prove it through the Akan language because we still speak these same terms. So that's the difference between what we do or, or other people who are actually doing some real research. They're comparing the Yoruba language to the language of ancient Kemet or the Bakongo language or the Ebe or phone languages or, or Wolof or something like that. They'll use the languages that exist today, that are still spoken today, and then make the direct comparisons. And then you also find, for example, in our various books and so forth, we'll show the names of deities, same names of deities, same functions in creation same descriptive title, so we can go into a great deal of detail that the dictionary can't because they didn't have the living culture. They didn't understand the living culture. They can just, for example, Jida in Akan means purification. It also means to celebrate a ceremony of purification. In the dictionary, it'll say Jida, and it'll spell it T-W-R or D-W-R-A. We know how to pronounce it because it's D-W-I-R-A, Jida, because we still use the term. In the dictionary, hieroglyphic dictionary, it'll say uh, purification. It also means to celebrate a ceremony of purification. It's the same definition, the same word. We have the same word in Akan, the same definition, the same, the proper vocalization, which they didn't have in the hieroglyphic dictionary. Plus, we know what the ceremony of uh, purification that they're talking about because we still engage in the Ojida ritual purification ceremony on a regular basis. So we know exactly what it is. So we can go into much more detail. When it comes to certain texts like the so-called Book of the Dead, for example, or some of the other texts that you see in Budge's work, you'll have the line of the Medusa, and the next line is the transliteration, and then the third line is English translation. The good thing about that mm. trilinear structure is that you can see the glyphs themselves, you can see the transliteration, You can see the mistakes he makes with the English translation, but again, we can use our own language to correct and do the translations ourselves. 
So at least he lays the glyphs out so you can do the translation yourself where you have other books where they just give you a translation and don't show you any glyphs at all. And then you're just going along with what they say. Like, for example, some right. of Faulkner's books, he'll just give you a translation and he's one of the worst, even though some people would say he's one of the better. He's more poetic, but he's one of the worst because he'll leave out entire tracts of the text He'll change things around. He'll take poetic license. He'll just change, just omit things. It's, it's really ridiculous. So if you don't have wow. a glyph right in front of you, uh, you know, where you can, you know, you can see these glyphs and see these words. You know, you see a word like jida. You see a word like undu or unduru. Well, we, we have those terms in our con. We can plug those in and they have the proper meanings. And when you read the whole text, it's the full meaning is there. So we can do the translations ourselves. So, that's the value of having some of Budget's books. He'll lay the glyphs out for you. Yeah, he'll have some mistakes in translation. So do the other scholars as well. But we're not relying on his translation. We just want to see the glyphs. Because for a while, right. you could even get your hands on a, a copy of the pyramid text anywhere. It's only been recently, over the last few years, that they've been posting a lot of stuff online. It used to be if you didn't have some access to some you know, research library, you could not get your hands on no pyramid text. And they were doing that deliberately. But now it's just been recently that, you know, people have been releasing more information and it's free, you know, open source and people can get their hands on primary text like that. Anybody can find something and download it. So that's, that's the only reason we'll look at that. Brother, I have one more question. I'm hope, hoping I'm not taking too much of your time. Um, seashell divination. Um, I come from... <clears throat> like an Islamic background and also um, dealing with like new age, metaphysical, whatever, whatever. I was dealing with that before I, I came across your information. <clears throat> um, so I, I can only, I live in North Carolina. I go into these little bookstores that the white people own and nobody can direct me towards anybody who practices hoodoo. Like, uh, um, and I can't find anybody searching online. So I'm, I'm asking you about sea cell divination. Like in your movie, is that gonna um, explain how that's done, or can you direct me towards a book or or somewhere where I can, you know, learn how to do that? Uh, now we will be yes, we will be talking about a form of sea shell divination, cockle shell divination, um, in the film. In fact, I'll be talking about that. Um, the book. I mean, I, I can't say a specific book. You know, there are a bunch of books out there where you'll see people talk. Sometimes they'll say seashell. Sometimes they'll say cockle shell, C-O-C-K-L-E. A lot of people utilize that term if they're talking about hoodoo. So you can kind of read between the lines with regard to that. Um, uh, you can send me an email. I can send you to a couple of people. Like, in fact, when you look on the site, for example, um, for the film, uh, mm-hmm. Kalinda Laveau does divination with, with different implements. Um, and I, it may be a couple of people I may be able to direct you to. I'll find some information, but it's not a particular book I could say, hey, get this book because there's so much misinformation out there right. to sit through. I've seen little books on seashell divination, and they were, you know, not necessarily, they were like half in and half out. So it's not something I would recommend. I don't even remember the names of them. I wouldn't even recommend. But send me an email. I'll, I'll send you a couple of links. So the, your, your email, um, or or can I message you on on Facebook? Please? Oh yeah, Facebook is good. I'll, I'll do that. Okay. Listen, brother, that, that was it. Appreciate I, I, I appreciate all your information and your help. Met I say. Yeah, I say that. Appreciate the call. Okay, so we have a few minutes left. Let me um, let me try to get one more call in here. Hold on one second. Okay, Michio, we're on the phone line. You had a question or comment, uh, number 1295. Michio, can you hear me? Yes. What's up? Okay, so yeah, I had a question about um, the uh, like earthbound spirit. As far as um, that's what I kind of that's what I kind of need soon soon that are in that realm, 
are they disaligned or detached from their crowd? And do we, if we end up in that realm, do we actually reincarnate from that realm or are African spirits in that realm subject to being, you know, disintegrated or whatever it is that happens to them? Okay, so first, um, some people are disaligned from their crowd in that realm. Some people are not. Some people are, you know, totally disaligned, you know, and some people are just uh, slightly, you know, out of harmony with order. So mm-hmm. it's just kind of like you have some people here who engage with some, you know, self-destructive negative behavior. They become depressed and things like that. Um but then you also have individuals who engage in, you know, super criminal type behavior, rape and murder and things like that. The crowd is totally left them. So just like you have that range here, you can have that range in those kind of earthbound spirits and they kind of collect together who are in the same energy complex. Um, yes, some of them do reincarnate from that space. And we talked about how, you know, Sometimes when people are operating like that, even the ones who are just were kind of self-destructive and died in a self-destructive, they weren't necessarily, you know, killing our people and stuff like that, but they were very self-destructive um, and transitioned like that. Uh, the wound is still, quote-unquote, open, so they can dwell in that negative state for a while they'll be drawn through a branch of the family who carries that same energy complex that they do, that lower vibrational energy complex. So, for example, you have two two grandparents, or two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, 32 great-great-great, 64 great-great-great-great. So even at that level of great-great-great-great-grandparents, you have 64 branches. And there may be one of those 64 branches that's much weaker. The people in that branch are much weaker than, you know, the other 63 branches. And if you are operating on that weak vibrational frequency, you'll be drawn to that branch that's the same kind of frequency that you you were operating on. You're drawn into a womb like that, and you'll be drawn into an environment where the people are not necessarily taking care of their children or they're the type that will allow their children to walk out in the street while they're sitting on the porch drinking or something like that, you're drawn into that kind of environment because you're operating on that level, and that's the kind of womb space you were drawn into. So it does happen where people uh, return in that space, and that, that causes a series of problems. That's, that's one of the reasons why ancestral religion is important, not only for every day, you know, living in harmony with order and trying to benefit your life and improve yourself, but that backlog of discarnate spirits of relatives who are disaligned who end up coming through weaker branches of the family and return with that same disorder they left with. And and substitution helps to remedy that. Of course, the only thing that will remedy that and kind of clear out that backlog, the more of us we get involved, the more of our discarnate family members who are trying to do something, but they're still, you know, just kind of self-destructive, but are receptive to doing something harmonious, um, you know, it, it, that's the only thing that can deal with that. Of course, some of them who are open to doing something harmonious can also be influenced by the ancestral community on the other side, and they can get some direction that way. But the ones who tend to be very deliberate within their disorder, and they're not trying to, you know, embrace what the ancestral community is trying to help them do, just like when they were living on Earth, they were, people are trying to show them a better way, and they're going to keep doing what they're doing, and they die in a negative state, and those are the people who will remain earthbound, and they will return still wounded with the wound still open and still open to infection. So, yes, that does happen. Okay, so after, after the cross, so like temporarily leaves you and goes and represents you back to uh, Nyama Nyamewa to give that report about, you know, how you lived your life and then returns to you and then you remain in the, um, you, you remain earthbound. Is that pretty much where you're going to be until you reincarnate, if you reincarnate, or is there a chance from that point for um, restoration and to move on from that point? into a higher higher realm. 
Well, no, you will. You will, uh, eventually you will reincarnate. It may be through a uh, direct line, or if that line had been cut off, you know, because certain people either had male children, or you know, people stopped having children, or something like that, which you know happens, or people get killed, or something like that. And that line is cut off. Then mm-hmm. you'd be rerouted through one of those other 64 branches. It may be a little bit more distant. Um, but you'll end up coming back through. But you, it's still it's, it's like the the whole thing with the Basa, with the leopard, who can navigate its way through the nocturnal regions. Um, mm-hmm. We have the capacity through our Ba, divine living energy, to connect with the Nsumafo, connect with the Aboso and so forth, so we can be empowered to do what we need to do and align ourselves with our crowd and everything. But if we do not, yeah, we'll be earthbound for a while. It differs for different individuals based on what they've done in their life and everything else. Some people, it could be 100 or so years. Some people, it could be longer than that. But at some point, we'll be drawn back through. And depending on what we've done, if that determines, you know, how we're kind of moved. We're not choosing a, a bloodline. We're choosing it to a certain extent by the choices that we've made, and we end up being drawn into a certain kind of bloodline or blood circle. But we'll we'll end up being drawn back, but we still have the capacity to, you know, move forward. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, I'm trying to understand, like, well, I guess specifically, if there is an earthbound spirit and for whatever reason they're um they 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 finally understand how to exist within divine order. Is there a chance for them to get some kind of restoration to where they can move into a different realm of the of the spiritual realm? Or would they remain earthbound until they go ahead and reincarnate? Um, no, okay, I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. No, if somebody decides they wanna start transforming, just changing their their existence, just like here. If you were, if somebody was hooked on heroin and doing other kinds of stuff and they were very self-destructive and people were always trying to help them out and they just always neglected it and they just kept uh, spiraling out of control, and at some point people just leave them alone and just stop, you know, trying to help because they're not doing anything and they get sick or whatever. Um but at some point after a number of years, some people will say, a percentage of them, a minority will say, you know what, I'm going to change my life. I need to stop doing this. And they're deliberate about, I want to transform. They may not have all the tools, but they are deliberate about, they want to make an effort to get back on track. And as soon as they make that effort, then those people who are in position to assist will come around and assist. And it's the same thing in the spirit realm. People who are in that position with regard to the ancestral community, with the non anomal Samafar, they're ready to assist somebody who's ready to deliberately move forward and transform themselves. And all that negativity and all that anxiety is no longer a gravitational pull that locks them into that earthbound existence. They become free. They loosen the bonds and, you know, they free themselves and they can move forward and dwell with the Insamafo. Let me, let me say this before. Um, there's 60 seconds left in the live broadcast. If people want to listen beyond, you know, 11 o'clock, you have to call in, get on the phone line, 646-787-8155, 646-787-8155. Um, if you can't join on, and we won't take too much longer, but if you can't join on the phone line, uh, yet I'll say for tuning in, please go to the fundraiser for our film. We're trying to, we can get this done literally in a day with the people who listen and who support the work and who read the books and so forth and it's benefited them. If it's benefited you, please support this effort. This is the the challenge that we have. We're either funding our enemies in blackface or we're funding something that benefits us. So please go to that site and yet I'll say, um, but so, yes, um, people who want to make transformation, yes. And that happens on a regular basis. Some people will dwell earthbound for 50 years. And at some point, and of course, the time frame is different in the spirit realm. The experience is different. And we experience that, that different time continuum, even in the dream state, where you can have a dream and you're awakened by your alarm and you hit the snooze button for five minutes, you fall back asleep. You have a series of activities 
only to be awakened five minutes later, you know, in the physical world, you could have never engaged in all those activities in five minutes. So the spirit world is moving quicker, you know, than the three-dimensional physical world. So we, 50 years is not the same, as, you know, 50 years here as far as experience was, but some people may have been, you know, earthbound for like 50 or more years before they decide that they're tired of that kind of suffering and they decide they want to move forward and transform their existence and then they are receptive. They're not repelled by the ancestral realm. They, they're making themselves receptive to that and then they get that kind of assistance and they can move forward and start to restore themselves and they'll be drawn into a branch of the family that's a little stronger. So yes, that, that happens. Uh, sure. Uh, sure. That's pretty cool, man. May I say for, uh, for your assistance tonight once again. Okay, Yeni Aceda. We appreciate the call. Okay, so we're going to take one more call, and then we'll be done. It's 11.01 right now. Um, Michelle Wall on phone line number 3011. You got a question or comment? Set up, question. Set up. All right, um, what I was speaking on is um, since we're dealing with uh, the, the, the Baca, um, dealing with, like, um, Atina Boa, the uh, animal total, dealing with cats, you know, dealing with cats, and uh, just dealing with cats, well, especially nocturnal cats. But it deal- All right, when you're dealing nocturnally, since you're dealing nocturnally, dealing with um the Ojiwa and purification, uh, since you are willing, um, I, I mean, because I have visions of the panther and also I have visions of butterflies, you know, butterflies, and not the butterfly, actually butterfly, but the stage of the butterfly, the cocoon of the butterfly, is that going through the night, like, since you are going through the night, emanated by uh, Amen and Amenet, that cutting through the space of the night, of the, the deep spaces of the night, the hunt, like the nocturnal, the cat hunt, their vision is it is radiated by uh, Ra and Riot vision or Ra, Ra and Riot, I mean, energy and spirit. And not only do you go through um, for hunt, I mean, the hunt or to protect, but you also go for, like you said, to seek out other opportunities so you can have nourishment when you regain, when you come to uh, that that peak or that break of of Atum Ra or when Ra is in harmony with Ka. Or, or Ra and Rayet or in harmony with Kai and Kayet. So you come to that full understanding of, well, not full understanding, but you come to an enlightenment of what you saw through the night, you know, by also, because I'm I'm looking at it through, when you go through the night, also you're dealing with Head, head Haru and, and also her linking or combining or conjoining uh, the complement together, bringing it from from people who are deceased to or the people who are deceased are, are getting them, so they can make their. I mean, if you're seeking for them to have harmony, or babies coming into the world, um, cutting off or executing the people who are trying to prevent the warriors and warrior arrests or the spirits who are trying to prevent the warrior, dishonest spirits who are trying to prevent the warriors, the warriors and warrets who are returning, warrior arrests who are returning to the earth. So they can share some of their journey with you so you can uh, uh, navigate yourself not only from that nighttime vision, but also through the day. Oh. 
<laughs> oh, no, see, so you, you you're basically saying that that um, the functioning of the that nocturnal functioning of the feline when they're in the darkness, of course, the energy of Ra and Rat that comes from the utilizing the sun that of course illuminates the moon, which illuminates the eyes of the feline, whether it's a uh, you know leopard or whatever it is. Um, that allows them to navigate their way through the darkness, to hunt, to protect themselves, but also as they're moving through, then they are empowered by the Abosom who are in the spirit realm. They're empowered by the Unsumampo. And then when they come through, they can bring the power and nourishment that they receive into the light of day in a harmonious way to help throughout the course of life and at the same time cutting through um, Yes, there are, you know, certain this kind of spirits who would seek to stop the return of the reincarnation of those warriors, warriors and warriors that we need to overthrow this enemy. So they're always trying to seek to suppress that. And that's kind of like, you know, our pep trying to stop the boat of Ra from making it through, but of course he makes it through. So is that what you're saying? Because, yes, that is, that's all inclusive with, within this whole notion of that nocturnal journey and navigating your way through the nocturnal journey so you can buy, which is that divine living energy, and saw, which is that sanctuary containing that divine living energy. You can operate within a container. You can still have that animate fire within a contained space, and you can be empowered when you're moving through the contained space. You can be illuminated while you're moving through, through the contained space. You can be nourished by while you're moving through that contained nocturnal space and come out the other side empowered and illuminated and guided and nourished and fortified. Yeah, you said that eloquently. <laughs> yeah, but that's what I was meaning. Oh, no, I appreciate it. No, that, that's good because you were bringing out that point of, yes, they will try to suppress uh, the return of those kinds of warriors and warriors, those akumfo. They, will, they don't want us, you know, giving birth to, you know, okumfo yao and, you know, nana abina aramita, <laughs> bringing those kind of people back. So even, you know, movies like this promoting this sexuality, homosexuality, like Black Panther thing or, you know, television shows or anything that they promote, it's always trying to turn our people away from what's in harmony with order, suppress our people, suppress our mindsets, and then we get into some disordered thought patterns, and then we start drawing the weaker, disordered kind of spirits to us as opposed to, you know, the strong, you know, warrior, warrioress types, and then the weaker ones end up, being drawn into the womb because we've lowered our vibration. Next thing you know, you're giving birth to the weaker kinds of individuals. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's part of their plan. They understand those basic machinations and dynamics of reincarnation. They don't want us to pay attention to that because when you understand the you know, ramifications of reincarnation, as we talked about before, Sim, the ramifications of reincarnation, then you change your whole mindset about how you're going to approach the world, and they don't want us to do that. And also, I was asking about uh, the butterfly, the, you know, uh, the cocoon of the butterfly, since we were going through okay. reincarnation, like the butterfly goes through a purification, uh, going through a slumber pro- process, not really slumber, but a rest period for a period of time, and then after that rest period is a transformation. Exactly. So now were you asking if that was um who that was connected to or Yeah, uh as far as because um the only butterflies that I normally see about in the method two is uh is the tigress butterfly. But um I've been having visions of the black tigress butterfly. Black butterfly. Now w- what you can do with regard to that and it's true with other, you know, Achenebois as well, but you want to find out, which, which you would have to find out from your Samafo, is this, a, is this totem specifically dealing with your ancestral clan or if it's dealing with a, a bosom connected to you or if it's a specific um, function that they are trying to get you to focus on, meaning it's not a... Uh, totem from one of your clans, but they're trying to get you to focus on a certain stage of your life, and they're showing you that, that unfolding of development, because maybe you're in that stage. You have to see, you know, what, 
why they're showing you what they're showing you. And that only comes directly from, you know, from them, whether it's ancestral, yeah. whether it's a boson deity, whether it's, um, you know, instructional, that kind of thing. Well, I'm not going to rush you. I know uh, the answers will be, in- I mean, I know the answer will be answered in time. So, you know, it's uh that I say with that, though. No, I appreciate it. You know, I said that. We appreciate the cost. Okay. Okay, so we have time for one last call. Um, it's you on the phone line number 0217. You had a question or a comment? Uh, good night, Brother Crazy. Um, my, my question has always been um, um, where my people are from. And um, I, I woke up, you know, like, and two names came to me. Um, so Linky and Songhai, and um, I looked it up briefly and saw that they were um, from um, Ghana Empire. What was the um, what is the time period as you know, like when um, uh, that place I guess existed? And did did you say uh, Soninke and Songhai? Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, so you have the first the empire of Ghana rising up. Some would try to say it was like quote unquote 300 A.D. beginning, but it, even before that, going back into you know maybe like 2300 years ago or 2500 years ago. Um, mm-hmm. But then maybe around uh, the so-called uh, 10 or 11 hundreds is when it began to start to fall and then the empire of Mali rose up and then after that, for you know, for the next couple hundred years and then the empire of Songhai rose up. So within a uh, Songhai started falling started falling as far as maybe so-called 1500, 1600s when they were kind of waning a little bit. So um, but the Soninke people have been there, but as far as being an empire, you know, a strong empire, um, they started rising up around the time of the Ghana Empire and the Mali Empire. So, but you want to see, I mean, but it doesn't, it, you don't have, just have to focus on the time period of when they became like a superpower. They were there before they became a superpower, when they were just, a, you know, a group, an ethnic group that was part of a, you know, region. And they could they would have been there earlier than the rise of the empires. Okay. No, no, no. It's just that um, I have not prior to. I mean, it's not those two are not common names that um you know that you see. Um. So I right. really was not familiar with it, and it was you know kind of a question. Um. In one of my because I I'm always like interested in you know. Um. You know, are we like even like walking among our ancestors, like as we live here on Earth and don't so, um, You know, like I said, one day like this, the name is kind of like came to me. You know, I actually woke up like saying that. I was like, what is this? So I wrote it down and, you know, kind of looked it up. Mm-hmm. So that's why I had okay. that question. Well, and I would also say when you're looking up the information, um, look also look at, you know, look at, into it from the context of pre-Islamic uh, Songhai, pre-Islamic Sonike society, because often people always just want to talk about, you know, Islamic empires. Um, okay. They want to focus on that, but you want to you go Google information about pre-Islam in those areas and you know, you'll get to certain, you know, documents or texts where people were focused on the culture of the people before they got involved in Islam, and you'll get more detailed information about the culture looking there. Or even sometimes, even some of the uh, sites that deal with artifacts, like art art galleries and things like that, mm-hmm. very often the art 
gallery, they'll have specific sculptures or, you know, other things, um, artistic creations. And when they're talking about them, they usually get the information directly from the owner of the piece. So if it was a, a ritual mask or something like that, then they'll say, oh, well, this ritual mask came from this particular shrine. It was for this particular deity, and this is what the priests or priests did. And they won't be focused on the Islamic stuff. They'll just be talking about that. But you can glean from that, you know, useful information about the culture. But if you just read a general history, um, very often those quote-unquote historians always want to focus on Islam and the effect of Islam in the area. They don't want to talk about the traditional culture, you know, outside of the Islamic corruption. Okay. Um, one other thing uh, related to your broadcast last night when you mentioned that um, in uh, burials, uh, with funerary and burial practices where people are um, buried like in their home. Um, as a child, I noticed in the um, Caribbean, at times people, mostly in the countryside, you go to a funeral, it takes place like in that person's like yard and if they have like a lot of land you are very like on the same on the land but what right. i also um, notice is that when people um purchase land build a home they would um pour um like rum liquor i mean i i know now that that's you know pouring libation and stuff like that so is it because um, that occurs that, you know, um, you know, ancestors are buried on the land that you were kind of like asking permission um, to, um, you know, like construct like a new home like, on the land because you don't, you don't, you don't necessarily know if um, someone is buried there? Uh, yeah, sometimes it is. If, if that's what's happening, they, of course, they, they would definitely do that if it was um, – that's the place where they were trying to stay. They're going to try to make sure there's not going to be any problems um, mm -hmm. with the spirits who are buried there. But then also sometimes, you know, they're in a place where they're not buried, but they're pouring libation to connect with, uh, you know, older ancestral spirits who've been there, you know, connected for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. Sometimes also just connecting with the Earth Mother, they want to make sure that the space they have is, you know, the energy is balanced and harmonious. So, you know, negative things won't happen to the home and things like that or accidents and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, sometimes it is because somebody was buried there and they did have some cemetery or somebody transitioned there or died there, was killed there or something like that, or sometimes they just want to get in harmony with the Earth Mother to make sure everything is, is preemptive, to make sure everything is straight. All right, and that's like a co common custom um, you know, you know, so I always thought it was that, you know, you kind of like ask information because somebody might have been very good. Right, yeah, sometimes you know, well, it is. It's definitely been. Okay. Well, thanks for answering my questions, Medasi. Okay. Yeah, I'll say that. Appreciate the call. Okay. So that was. Uh, that was the last phone call on the line, so we're going to end the broadcast here. But again, get out say, please go to the fundraiser site now, Amado Capo underscore Adebisa. Any contribution is welcome, and you you can see the progress on the uh, site. You can see where we're at. We're at 49% now. It's always good to see um, when a donation comes through or two donations come through and the percentage moves up to, you know, 50% of 51, we can see how close we're getting. We also track the support of the community and how, you know, how people are responding to the information, to the publications and so forth by, you know, seeing the percentage begin to increase. We remember when we were at 1%, so we're at 49%, and of course we want to get to 100%, and that can definitely be done. The sooner we can get there, the sooner we can complete the film within about 30-day process. Um, and the sooner it can be released, and we can really start impacting our people on a larger scale. So whether it's $5, 10 or whatever it is, please support. And yet I say to those who have supported so far and some who 
given more than once. And yet I'll say for tuning in to this broadcast once again. And yet, Bishop Abiel, we will meet again. Hit up.